Chinese tech giant Huawei has been in the news a great deal recently, not least for the detention in Canada of its chief financial officer, which some are saying has political motives. I'll be looking at the political aspects of the detention, and I'll also be asking why so many countries are now putting up barriers against the use of Chinese 5G technology in their networks. Welcome to The Point, live from Beijing, I'm Li Xin. It's been a tough time for Huawei, Chinese telecom equipment giant. First, there is the much talked about detention of the company CFO, which has been compared by some to uh, kidnapping, uh, even in the Western media. Chinese uh, Vice Foreign Minister Liu Yucheng summoned the U.S. Ambassador to China, Terry Branstad, to lodge an official protest against the detention of uh, Meng Wanzhou. In a Sunday statement, Liu called the U.S. actions a serious violation of the legal and legitimate rights and interests of a Chinese citizen. He called on the U.S. to immediately correct this wrongdoing by withdrawing Meng's arrest warrant. China warned it would react further according to the U.S.'s response. A day earlier, China also summoned the Canadian ambassador to China, John McCallum, and urged Canada to immediately release Meng or face grave consequences. Now, Meng appeared in a British Columbia court on Friday for her bail hearing. After nearly six hours of arguments and counter-arguments, the hearing was a adjourned until Monday. At issue now is whether Meng should be set free while her extradition case proceeds. Meanwhile, Huawei seems to be countering more of a barrier in countries that are allied to the United States. Japanese government decided on Monday to effectively exclude Huawei and ZTE, another Chinese tech company, from public procurement, widening the list of countries that have pushed back against Chinese technologies and companies on so-called security issues. Britain's BT Group said uh, last week it would not use Huawei in central parts of its next network. New Zealand and Australia have stopped telecom operators using Huawei's equipment in new 5G networks, citing possible Chinese government involvement in their communications infrastructures. But uh, the French and uh, German ministers in relevant departments, by contrast, have said that Huawei is still welcome in their nations. So what is it about 5G that that are dividing these countries? What's the danger of making policies on shaky evidentiary standards? And what's at stake for these countries who are treating leading Chinese tech companies with possible hysteria? I'm joined in Hong Kong by Thomas Law, co-founder and CEO of Ping West in Beijing, by Rick Dunham, director of the Global Business Program at Tsinghua University, and Edward Lehman, senior foreign fellow at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. First, a very quick explanation as to where we are in terms of uh, judicial process. Uh, Edward, you please. Right. I, I mean, on the judicial process, extradition is a very um, dicey thing, and it's a very specialized area. First of all, it has to be a crime within the country of which, which is committed, which is open for negotiation. There was some uh, sealing of what the exact charge was, per se, and that there has been cooperation between the United States Department of Justice and the Canadian federal, uh, the central government as well. Um, and it, it, you know, it does seem that she was on her way to Mexico, and she was apprehended at that time. And again, you know, this does not seem to be an even-handed situation, at least from a legal perspective. It also doesn't seem to be. Uh, what do you mean? What do you mean by not an even-handed situation? Well, I mean, you know, the justice is uh, sometimes unevenly distributed amongst those persons that they decide to target for these particular things. And I don't think it's an accident that this happened to happen at this particular time. That this is. Uh, I'm, there's probably been times that she has been transit elsewhere, but this happened to be at the same time that there was the meeting between Xi Jinping and President Trump. Now, John Bolton had declared that, you know, the federal government and the FBI and uh, Department of Justice are large institutions and that they don't necessarily, uh, you know, tell the president everything that they're doing. But that this was happening almost at the same time uh, seems to have larger implications. And so sometimes the, the justice is treated fairly, except sometimes more fairly than others. And perhaps this is a case of that, it seems mm. to me. Well, um, are you saying that uh, there is a lot of politics at play here? And I'll get back to you. Sure. But first, let me ask this question to Rick. Well, the problem is everything is so opaque. We have charges that are sealed. So we don't know exactly what it is. 
we hear reports and there was discussion in court. Was it misleading investors, which could be a crime punishable in U.S. and Canada and U.S. by 30 years in prison? That would be by, by making false statements uh, that could affect stocks. Uh, but it, I mean, everything is opaque. We are guessing, did Donald Trump know? We're guessing, did the Chinese, does the Chinese government have any particular sway with Huawei? The problem here is we have limited number of facts that we know and there's a lot of speculation that both, both governments are engaging in and the media is engaging in. So I think we should say what we know, what we don't know, try to, try to stick to the facts and then you know, debate what, speculation. What is the fact here? So, um, okay. for instance, is this a pure criminal case? Is it a pure Ju uh, you know, judicial case that we're looking well, at. That's, I mean, that's an excellent question. It would ha for extradition, extradition, it would have to be a criminal case. By e extradition treaties between U.S. and Canada, it would have to be a crime that's subject to at least one year imprisonment. So you can't. You, I mean, in theory, you can't extradite someone for something minor. And the extra, I mean, the extradition is so rarely. Uh, tried and, and I mean, to, to me what was strange as somebody who runs a global business journalism program is you have a business person right in the middle of what arguably is a political or a trade dispute and it's so rare that you have uh, you have executives arrested uh, and you know, so I think we can ask the questions the mm -hmm. problem is we don't really have a lot of answers right mm -hmm. now, but I think we should ask the questions and try to get answers from the governments, from U.S., from Canada, from yeah. China. And just to try to put it in perspective about, okay. okay, so, I mean, in essence, what Rick was talking about is if it's over a year, that would be considered a felony, which yeah. is something serious, okay? And just so for our Chinese viewers, it's uh, anything that's over three years is considered to be serious, and it can be expunged from the record. So it's a little bit of a different uh, yardstick with right. regards to that. And again, this is an economic crime, which again is a crime, but it, it's uh, with kind of a, could be a small C or a large C, again this is the large part of speculation, 30 years in prison or something less, and, and with regards to UN sanctions and with regards to Iran, th these are the these are the well, things. Well, let's that not are pretend things. that we're not hearing the pre what the press are saying, what the yeah, commentators sure. are saying. I mean, it's it's pretty clear. A lot of Western commentators are calling this. Uh, in you know, I, I'm not saying that this is a pure uh, judicial case. That there is politics there, even for the for the Canadian judicial system, mm -hmm. for that judge who has this opportunity to decide whether to bring to send her across the border down south or not, this is going to be a political, this is a political case. What's your comment on, on, I mean, I on that? A, it was a political decision to arrest her. Uh, it, she wasn't going to Vancouver. I mean, she has homes there, but she wasn't going there to stay. She was in transit. And again, th it's very, very unusual to have a situation like this. Uh, so, I mean, I, it, 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 it really forces us to ask the questions of uh, of political involvement, and then you have to start getting into motives: who was involved and why. Yeah. Well, well the, the, and the other thing, I mean, I, the, what, with what Rick said, it's that she does have a home there. Does she have to be put in handcuffs and shackles, and then have to be detained in in uh, um, in, a, in a jail-like setting? rather than have an ankle bracelet. I mean, I don't think she poses a threat to the society necessarily per se. So, I mean, uh, some of these things might be well, over. One of the reasons dramatic. they say she cannot be granted bail is because she's extremely rich. And I, <laughs> I find that uh, a little bit hard to, uh, hard to understand. Anyway, it is theoretically true that uh, these judicial systems are designed to be totally independent uh, outside of the administrative branches of the society, uh, whether it is in the United States or in Canada. Nevertheless, we have to say that the Canadian judicial independence is under very heavy scrutiny here. Um, what kind of consideration they would have to make uh, in, ter in terms of this case? Well, first I would say this is one where I would divide Canadian law enforcement and Canadian justice. All right. The Canadian justice system really does have a reputation for being above politics. The problem is, once you get it into the legal system and you have a legitimate case uh, for extradition, then I even if it was a political decision to bring the case, even then if the Canadian justice system operates without political uh, favor, uh, once, the, once, the, once the process gets going, uh, it could result in, in, 
in an extradition that would be seen as political. So I think that it was the original decision to apprehend her, to bring her into custody, that is what we have to focus on. And yeah. the other problem is, is that you also have to look at the, uh, the time frame here, because extradition is not a short process. It's, it's only short if someone decides to waive their rights to extradition and actually go and face that. And if I was advising uh, in this particular case, I would say not to waive those things. But it, it's probably around 60 or it could be up to 90 days before okay. this is resolved. Well, this is, these are the nitty gritties of uh, a, 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 a case that has been um, that is uh, being considered against an existing law in the United States, an existing law in Canada. But this really begs the question as to whether the U.S. Uh, has this long arm jurisdiction that we are talking about. You can say, okay, these are U.S. laws, they are published out there, everybody is supposed to, to respect that. But if you zoom out and, and think about it, um, everybody who uses this, the US, U.S. dollar is subject to U.S. Uh, criminal investigation if they're buying something from Iran, right? That's right. No, I mean, specifically, that's right, about the long arm. And this has to do with banking laws, policies, and regulations under FACTA, under OECD. And these have become quite complex, which make people like Rick and I, who are overseas, America, America's living overseas, it's extremely difficult for us to remain compliant with regards to the banking institution. And this is part of what, again, it's very opaque what she's being charged with but manipulating the financial or the banking system in some way, shape, or form with regards to doing business with uh, Iran. And as a result, and again, this is kind of unclear as to what it is, but it could be doing some kind of trade with Iran, which would oversee some of the uh, UN but sanctions. But given the kind of uh, in interaction, <coughs> the intertwinedness of the global supply chain, it is just impossible for any company just to say, you know, out of so many branches that I, that I have and out of so many companies that I possibly can control stocks, none of them is going to have any possible interaction with a company in Iran, Rick. Uh, that's true. And right now the EU is shifting from uh, dollars for petroleum purchases to euros so that they don't have the issue that we're talking about here of dollar purchases. But nobody's chasing after these companies, you know, that's the thing. <laughs> well, but that could happen. I mean, you know, the, who knows what, what, what the situation will be with the Trump mm. administration what his feelings are about France or, or Germany or other European countries down the road. Yeah, but I think uh, an overwhelming feeling among many Chinese and scholars at this moment is that, yes, the law is the law, but is bad law the bad law? I mean, if, if this is the way how things are going to do, then we can enact a lot of laws as well that are you know, possibly incriminating uh, U.S. nationals or, or British nationals for something they do outside of their country well, because we I, consider I mean, that I, I think human. Chinese... Uh, people, Chinese academics, Chinese lawyers, Chinese policymakers, are feeling some of the feelings that uh, global businesses have felt over time for, I mean, the law is law in China, foreign companies have to abide by the law. A lot of time the foreign companies don't like the laws in China, they have to abide by them. Uh, but, I mean, what but mostly Chinese laws are not saying you can't do business with a foreign country. That's right. <laughs> that's I the know, difference I know. here. That's, and it's exactly right. And that, that's, that's where we have a difficult situation here. I feel, very, I feel very uncomfortable criminalizing business. I mean, there's one thing if there are obvious lies under oath. I could see that. That's a legal issue. Uh, I, I think it, it, it's a slippery slope. And whether, whether, whether it's Huawei and Iran or many, many other international issues where, where you're right. It's sort of third, third party countries uh, that you're doing business in and you're charged in the United States or you're charged in the EU. Mm. Well, this but the one thing that I also yeah, see, the, the, advance, well, the advancement with regards to China is that in some places extraterritorial is allowed. So in Russia and Poland right now, a judgment in Poland is, is the same as valid as a judgment in China and judgment in Russia is the same. And along the One Belt, One Road, they're starting to see some law being exported, which will make China be closer to this situation. It's not there yet, but and it takes a long time to get a judgment in Poland or Russia longer than in China. So well, we then when China gets there, the U.S. Must, should not complain. Right. <laughs> That's yeah. the thing. <laughs> anyway, we're going to take a very short break. Our guest in Hong Kong has been waiting for a long while, but uh, we're going to come back after this short break and continue talking about uh, this case, but uh, from a different angle, the competition in the 5G technology. Stay with me.
Welcome back. As I said earlier in the uh, leading of this uh, edition, that there seems to be growing blockade against Huawei in countries that are allied to the United States. Uh, let me go to our guest, uh, Thomas Law, who is with us uh, in Hong Kong. Hi, Thomas. Uh, sorry for keeping you waiting for so long. Hi. Now is the, the question for you. It's okay. Yeah, why is the race on 5G technology so crucial and so divisive at this moment? Okay, sure. You know, just uh, the 5G technology, yeah, it is really crucial. It now, just yeah, five, in, in, we are not currently in the 4G area, so, you know, we see the 4G has changed our life a lot, you know, on the live streaming, on the social network, and on, on, and on a lot of things. But for the 5G, it's all about the machine to machine connection and about the artificial intelligence. So I think it's really crucial for the most cutting edge technologies in the coming probably five to ten years. So that's the why 5G is really crucial for the, uh, the competition among different uh, companies. And now so far in the world, I think in the Qualcomm and the Huawei are probably the most important two major companies who are compete with in the 5G market and with different standards and with different technologies, I think. So I think and that's the, the, the 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 general roadmap and about the 5G and why it is so important and uh, and how Huawei and Qualcomm are now in the market to compete in uh, uh, in different countries. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, the latest that I've uh, found out is that uh, the U.S. Uh, relevant. Uh, um, uh, Mm -hmm. People and or institutions in the United States are continue are con, uh, increasingly um, wary of uh, the kind of uh, competitiveness China has demonstrated in this field. Now, in a November report, a U.S. Commission on U.S.-China Economic Security urged U.S. Congress mm -hmm. to direct the National Telecommunications and Information Administration and Federal Communications Commission to identify with a particular focus on the threat posed by equipment and services designed or manufactured in China. Uh, explain to us why are Chinese uh, tech firms in the 5G so particularly scrutinized? Yeah, I think it's just uh, uh, it, at the current moment, I think, and just uh, they, they show their worry about the, uh, or just uh, pay close attention on the uh, 5G or the, the reading or, the, or this kind of the high technology equipment uh, developing in China is because I think it's a China now during the past years and have been doing great achievements on some kind of the developing markets including the uh, uh, the Southeast Asia or the Middle East or even the Africa market and they did a lot on that kind of things and uh, during the past five years or ten years and if you just noticed uh, just uh, Huawei uh, has approached a lot in the Western markets in, uh, especially in the Europe markets and, ha and uh, now we see the France and the uh, Germany and the UK and a lot of the uh, Europe markets and now in Huawei just uh, approached a lot. Uh, so I think just this kind of things happen. So I, so yeah, so. Okay, it, so, so you're so saying basically it, that it is uh, really Huawei is too competitive, right? Is that what's making. Uh, it's it's somehow competitive. Somehow I think. competitive. Yeah, I have to say it's somehow competitive. Yeah, Why? So Why somehow? Not uh, really? Not really. I think it just it's, it still takes a long way to go. And, you know, just uh, during the past, I think the five years in the Huawei contribute where they they put a lot of a lot of money and on the uh, basic mm -hmm. uh, and the most cutting edge technology development. So I think the most uh, so they bear the fruit. I think during the past five okay. years, but it still takes a way to go. It's okay, just, let me Huawei come back. Trying to get into the more markets. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Let me come back to my uh, studio guest here. Mm -hmm. Look, uh, one of the reasons is that Huawei is com increasingly competitive. Where they are, we do not know at this moment. There is a long way to go, I must admit, which is what I've heard as well. But I think another very important re reason is Huawei's connection with the Chinese government, even with the Chinese Communist Party. As some people are saying, look, you have improper links to the Chinese state and you have been touted by the Chinese state as a, a national champion so there must be something um, hidden there that one day you know if they want you will just uh, pass intelligence to them. Rick what uh, what is your reaction well, to that? I think I mean the bottom line is there is protectionism at play here. Protectionism in two ways. One is economic protectionism with Qualcomm and, uh, and <coughs> the US government in particular but Australia, UK, others, New Zealand uh, would rather keep it out of the marketplace. The second is the issue 
of security and uh, you know, sidestepping the issue of Chinese government, Communist Party. Uh, the, the, if, you, if you look at the uh, leaks of the uh, NSA files, the Snowden case, U.S. government tapped into uh, phones and, and devices and uh, in theory, the Chinese government could do the same thing. Whether or not there is a link, whether or not there is a backdoor, all the things that are the rumors in, 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 in media. And so the U.S. government would just rather not uh, have, have the vulnerability. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's a false argument to talk about uh, Chinese Communist Party links uh, because any business in China is going to have Chinese Communist Party links. It's by, de by definition, businesses, even if they are completely independent, uh, have to uh, coexist and their, their goal is to serve national priorities. So, yeah, and they I, have I, to be on good terms with the, the right. government so on saying, their various I, I levels. Say, right? I, I don't really think we need to, to, de to debate that, that part. I think the question is uh, if there would be any kind of uh, threat to the security of users, and, and that's all speculative. Yeah, see, th this is the thing now. They are accusing Huawei of uh, being uh, vulnerable, of uh, being possible collaborators with the Chinese government in terms of intelligence. So whose responsibility is it to prove that they are right, the accused one or the one who accuses? Edward? Well, I mean, you know, the, some of this stuff is pu are public secrets, really, to be honest with you. I mean, Boeing, for example, is the, is the largest defense uh, contractor, I think, in the United, beneficiary in the United States. Um, when they were making aircraft for, for China, this is a number of years ago, there were some incidences that were, again, public secrets that uh, there was some foul play done by, by putting some uh, plants within these uh, uh, aircraft. And so I think a lot of this is, is kind of known. And there are, you know, the usual suspects, Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, uh, Hughes Aircraft or Hughes Aviation. I mean, there's a whole number of different companies in the United States that are in together with the United States defense industry or the United States government. It, these types of things are not unusual, and so you can't just point the finger in one direction and not in the other direction. Um, sometimes we choose to ignore it uh, as a public secret, and sometimes we go forward. Of course, you couldn't be in this industry like Huawei or CTE without some kind of dispensation or papal uh, or uh, you know some sort of a, a approval by the government because these are protected industries for the national security. Um, and so I I think that you know th this is uh, you know uh, an example where. Both sides have uh, issues that, that they don't always bring to, to boost until look, they have to. Look, one of the sentences in a, in a, in a news report uh, from Australia about uh, Australia's decision to, uh, to keep Huawei out it says that the problem is Huawei's claim doesn't respond adequately to the evidence-based skepticism on which the Australian government based its decision. Uh, evidence-based skepticism. Do we have any evidence that Huawei has actually, you know, breached these uh, these security confidence and 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 there is a backdoor <laughs> here? Do we have evidence here? I, mean, I would say it's speculation-based skepticism <laughs> because I mean, if 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 there is evidence, the public is not being told, uh, and uh, I mean, this is this is a problem to disprove a negative and uh, in the political world it happens often that that's all the that's, time with the Russian poison, sure. poison and, case and, yeah. and, and uh, you know but but if there's evidence it should be presented and if there's evidence and the US government or the Australian government says that it would endanger uh, intelligence assets they should say that I mean right yeah, now right now it's just speculation to me that makes me feel uncomfortable even though there are legitimate issues of security to be discussed. Well, then there is um, Mr. Robert uh, Hanningen, who is former head of the Government Communications Headquarters Intelligence Agency in the UK, and uh, that agency deals with the cybersecurity. He said that uh, people should be warned of hysteria over Chinese technology. He said, my worry is there is sort of a hysteria go growing. We need a calmer approach. Uh, Edward, do you agree here? You know, I do. I mean, I think that the, there's a big broad brush that's painted that, that China is somehow evil in some sectors. I mean, I've been to these international conferences where they say, hey, if you've visited China, you should throw away your mobile device, you should throw away your computer, just use it one time. I mean, it's a little bit over the top for those of us who are, are living here. You have to buy a lot of phones. Right. <laughs> 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 
the <laughs> Huawei phones or, or what, which, which brand. Um, but I mean, at the, at the end of the day, I do think it's, uh, it's pumped up by hysteria. And, and uh, like I said, this is kind of a public secret about what is happening. There isn't the hard evidence yet, and, and we're waiting for that to come out. And it certainly hasn't been adjudicated by triers of fact. It's been triers of rumor and innuendo and, and hyperbole in, in some of the media in the United States, depending on which side you listen to. But both of them. Anyway, this is happening, right? This is happening. And these uh, allies in the so-called uh, uh, Five Eyes, right. these countries are complying under the pressure of the United States. Where do you see things growing? And what are the consequences? You know, eventually, if Huawei is really blocked out of these countries, but Huawei will continue to grow as at its utmost, uh, you know, efforts, what, what are we going to see? I mean, I see it as a consequence. I see it's developing as a result also of the Trump administration stepping back from multilateralism of almost two economic systems developing with China Belt and Road, with China technology and the Chinese uh, technological innovations sort of in a separate world than the American influenced uh, world. And I, mean, I don't think it's good for the global economy, uh, but I, it's sort of, I, mean, I don't know if you would say economic cold war. I would rather think of it as sort of parallel economic universes, and we're heading down yeah. those roads. The question is, will we keep going? Will they di diverge more, or will we get back from hysteria and, and sort of talk of the What's common, your prediction, though? Which, uh, which is more yeah, possible? I, I'd say, see who's president of the United States in two years. I think that makes a I really do think that makes a big difference. The, yeah. the uh, Trump direction uh, of the United States just uh, is different than, uh, than, than, than presidents of both parties before him. Okay, Edward? No, I don't disagree. And I, and I think that where the growth is going to be coming is in, is in developing countries in Africa and Southeast Asia and Asia. And I, and I think that at the end result, I think that this, which seems like a large negative in very developed countries in the Five Eyes, is actually going to be geopolitically and economically a big boost for, for Huawei and ZTE in, in developing countries. Mm. In those Let me uh, give the final question to Thomas, who has been waiting in Hong Kong. Thomas, uh, what is the consequences for consumers in countries such as Five Eyes, what are they going to live uh, experience when Huawei is blocked out of it? Uh, uh, well, I think it's Huawei so far now, and they they are ready to just sign sign the agreement with the different operators and uh, with over twenty hundred uh, with over twenty countries in uh, on this kind of a five G agreement. Mm -hmm. So I think. Uh, by taking the long view, I think, and they will continue to develop or to continue continue to grow up their markets mm. in, uh, in in multiple countries, in various of countries. So I think, and that's the major trend. But the but the most crucial part, I think, is the Euro market and how does people think about it, how the Euro, how the Europe countries uh, and, the Euro, uh, and the Europe countries government thinking about uh, whether Huawei is yeah. a threat or it still can uh, okay. collaborate with. I think this right. should be uh, the m most crucial part. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, the Chinese market is anyway big. It's big enough uh, in itself, and uh, European countries have their problems to deal with as the, at this particular moment. We have to leave it there. Uh, Thomas Law, co-founder and CEO of digital yeah. media company Ping West, uh, Rick Dungan, director of the Global Business Program at Tsinghua University, and Edward Lehman, senior foreign fellow at the Chinese a Academy of Social Sciences. And uh, that's it for this edition of The Point with Li Xin. As always, follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle The Point with LA. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.